All right, so the presentation slides are on the website if you'd like to follow along on your laptops. So today's lecture is about that term, cyber warfare, and the history of it, the public perception of it, the reality, and the problems we face. So here we are in 2013, and the big buzzwords are big data, the cloud, and everything's being connected. And we have terabytes, like we have like zettabytes of information generated each day, and we're only analyzing 1% of it. And everyone's thinking about more effective ways of analyzing, you know, that 99% of things. And then 99% of things is, you know, all these new technologies that are being connected together. Your toaster is now connected to the internet, perhaps, um, if you buy the right model. So before I go on, I want to have a disclaimer saying that the views I present here in this lecture are not the opinions of my employers, nor is most of this really even my own opinion. Every single thing I cite, a uh, news article stating this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened. So these are it's just a lecture based on observations. So we're going to go over a brief history. We're going to talk about advanced persistent threats. We're going to talk about the weaponization of O-Days, um, basically cyber weapons, um, critical in infrastructure problems in the Internet of Things, the problem of perception and uh, attribution, and we're going to end with the debate on policy if we get there. I have a lot of slides. So the re this is not a complete history of cyber warfare, but I try to go over a lot of really interesting events. I certainly don't capture all the things that are going on in Europe and Asia. Um, this is more of a Western perspective. Um, so <clears throat> the events that I'm going to talk about are in this uh, history of cyber warfare because I consider them either to be covert operations between nations or groups, part of a civil war or a revolution, or in some effect uh, related to basically governments or government versus insurgents. And the definition of insurgent actually could is from Merriam-Webster, I think, a person who revolts against civil authority or an established government. So that's interesting to think how that could be skewed for political reasons. Um, so, cyber warfare is essentially politically motivated hacking to conduct sabotage or espionage. For sabotage, it could be disruptive activities uh, like uh, DDoS. It could be actually destructive activities like deletion of IP. Uh, it could be censorship. Um, for espionage, it could be for the purpose of a more real-world espionage uh, in relating to doxing targets. Doxing means basically finding out who someone is uh, online. So if you have a forum username, finding out their actual identity would be doxing. That. That's just a term that's been used throughout the ages. Um, stealing industrial uh, intellectual property, spying on financial systems. And the history of cyber warfare dates back to the Cold War. Um, in 1982, there was a rather interesting event called the Trans-Siberian Soviet Pipeline Sabotage. Essentially, um, if I get all my facts right, there was a massive KGB operation um, called Line X. Uh, the Soviet Empire was basically a couple decades behind on the technology and microelectronics design. And they aimed to bridge that gap by stealing all the IP for everything and all the design schematics from the West. So they trained a basically army of moles, scientist moles, to infiltrate companies, agencies, and steal blueprints and leak them back. Um, the CIA was tipped off and basically a story that you can read about if you go to the, the link here, it's about the farewell dossier. Uh, basically, a KGB colonel flipped, gave up all these moles, and instead of arresting all of them, what, what the CIA decided to do was the most brilliant move they could have done, uh, counterintelligence-wise, is that they, having known who they are, whatever the strategy they chose would have been a win-win. Either they, they find all of them, they arrest them all, the operation's ruined. What they decided to do instead of arresting them, let them keep operating them, let them keep operating, but feed them bad info. Feed them schematics for things that they could build, but a week, a month, maybe a couple months off the production line, it would fall apart. And so this actually sabotaged Line X from the inside because they couldn't discern. They started doubting the, you know, the veracity of the information given to them by their moles. And so the whole thing kind of just fell apart. So it was an excellent uh, choice. 
So what happened um, with this, the, the Soviet pipeline is that the CIA was tipped off that a KGB mole was aiming to steal a data system uh, blueprint uh, for pipelines, like big natural gas oil pipelines, and they were going to use it somewhere in Russia. So what the CIA did is they went to the company and like, hey, you have this guy who's stealing your stuff. Instead of firing him, give him this document instead. And the document had a little bug in the code for the SCADA controller, and it was basically a logic bomb that was set to fail. Now, they didn't really intend to plan, they didn't plan it to go this way, but the Russians took it, they built it, they implemented it in their backbone for uh, natural gas and oil coming from Siberia, and what resulted is they caused the pipeline to explode at a critical uh, uh, fork. The resulting explosion was one-third the size of Hiroshima. And we actually detected that it, we thought it was a nuclear uh, launch on our system. So it <laughs> was, was pretty funny. Um, it's a good read anyways. So that goes back to 1982. In 1999, uh, during the Kosovo War, uh, a NATO jet actually bombed a Chinese embassy in Belgrade. They bombed it because it was providing communication support for the Yugoslav army. Um, Twelve hours later, the Chinese Red Hacker Alliance formed, basically among Chinese uh, citizens, and uh, they've been basically active to date. Essentially, they all gathered together on IRC channels and whatnot, and in a, basically a patriotic effort, launched massive cyber attacks at the time against NATO uh, countries, um, so, essentially, they took down uh, U.S. government websites, uh, English websites, everything else, um, as many as they could. And so, this is important to talk about because it culturally marks uh, a much different atmosphere about hacking in the East, and that it can be often a patriotic thing to do. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a few slides. So, which brings us way ahead of time to 2007. Uh, Estonia uh, had a park that it had some old Soviet memorabilia in it, an old Soviet statue in it. It had a World War II era Soviet soldier, uh, there was a bronze statue. It was removed from the park and this offended many uh, uh, Russian citizens in the Federated States of Russia. And so allegedly what happened after that in response is that a combination of government organizations and uh, Russian citizens collaborated to take down the Estonian internet. Um, the Russian government officially denies any involvement, but some describe it as the first actual war in cyberspace because it was a month long campaign of na nation scale distributed denial of service and tar targeted hacking. A year later, we saw uh, the Russo-Jordan War, um, and that's noteworthy because uh, there were combined uh, cyber and kinetic attacks uh, at the same time, and that basically websites would get DOS to perhaps distract the enemy, and then the tanks would flank around and take the city. Um, so uh, it was a very interesting read. I have for the required reading, uh, which I probably don't have listed properly on the right date. Uh, a number of articles uh, showing how uh, basically forensic investigators in Georgia actually tracked down and doxed many of the Russian hackers, and they were across the, they were operating across the street from basically the FSB's uh, main one of their main sites. So it's an interesting read, and it has some interesting implications. Um, in two thousand in December two thousand eight, there was Operation Cast Lead. Um, this was also uh, simultaneous cyber and kinetic attacks launched by Israel against Hamas. Uh, so they would take down DDoS websites, take down their communications, props, their forums, or IRC channels, and at the same time, you know, have kinetic force, have troops move in, tanks, etc., artillery. So the targets in both those attacks included both state and non-state civilian actors which is interesting um, and raises some questions about the <coughs> ethics of cyber war. What is off limits? Um, so in 2009, there was a coordinated uh, DOS of the financial sector and we still don't know who did it. 
um, suspects include North Korea and uh, criminal elements in the United Kingdom, and it was really never solved. It's still a mystery today. In 2009 to early 2010, uh, the Tulip Revolution, or the second Tulip Revolution, was basically the culmination of months of unrest leading up to Kyrgyzstan's uh, second revolution. And essentially, it involved basically a government cyber crackdown on dissidents, and the government would target its, its civilians uh, it happened to be expressing dissenting opinions, perhaps dox them, find them out online. And in one incident, uh, uh, Genady Pavlyuk uh, got his email hacked, and then they tracked him down and killed him. And what happened in the revolution is the government was basically overthrown. And so this brings us to WikiLeaks in April 2010. They've had a number of leaks since this. It's not necessarily cyber warfare, but it definitely influences cyber warfare and cyber warfare policy because this was the largest known leak of classified documents ever. Imagine if, since Bradley Manning just uh, confessed, I can say, imagine if Bradley Manning took it and sold it to another country instead of giving it to WikiLeaks. We would be none the wiser. But because he took it and gave it to WikiLeaks, everyone's wiser about insider threats now. We also lost all that information, but we know we lost all that information. If he sold it, he could probably buy his own island, we'd all be none the wiser, and some other country would know all our secrets at that level. So on the US government side, this was as big as 9-11, for obvious reasons. Um, it woke everyone up on insider threats, um, but it's interesting to know that the act of leaking uh, all these documents on the Iraq-Afghanistan conflict actually caused collateral damage. Uh, the Taliban used this information to find all the informants that they could and execute all of them. And so there's a number of articles that you can find about that. And I have some uh, sources for that too later on. So while we're still in 2010, in June, Stuxnet was discovered, at least Stuxnet version 1 or 1.1. Um, and everyone in the room should be familiar with it. it target Iranian nuclear weapons enrichment centrifuges, um, and it got detected because it spread widely beyond the intended target. It infected uh, basically non-SCADA systems uh, and non, you know, uh, lab systems, escaped the network and hit other systems on the internet. Um, it is widely believed to be the work of the U.S. and Israel collaborating together according to many news websites. Um, so, GhostNet also is worth talking about in 2010 um, because the US government officially announced that I identified a wide-scale Chinese military cyber espionage attack or campaign aimed at American companies and government agencies. Um, this is significant because it's basically an official declaration of we're a victim here and you are doing it, and you need to stop, basically. Um, so it's all detailed here in uh, a DOD report that's unclassified. However, some of the evidence, I guess, is classified and obviously was left out. Um, and their reports uh, indicate that they suspect there's a heavy use of the Chinese government of using uh, civilian computer experts in their clandestine cyber attacks. Um, however, because they don't really have the, the, because the report essentially mounted more to, hey, US government, we are actually getting attacked. This is our official stance. So everyone is on the same page working in Washington. Um, there was no real uh, smoking gun evidence at the time, however. So it is easily dismissed. Uh, which brings us to 2011, and that was most notably marked by the Arab Spring. Um, and Anonymous had a lot of activity then. Um, Anonymous may, you know, have a number of uh, disagreements with the U.S. government, but in this instance, Anonymous and the U.S. government actually agreed on many things. It just happened that the stars aligned in that way. Um, so, essentially, the Jasmine Revolution kicked off the whole Arab Spring, and that uh, the Tunisian state-controlled internet service provider uh, AMMAR hacked the usernames and passwords to track down uh, dissidents, 
uh, basically protesting civilians, and then they would assassinate them. Um, and so Anonymous fought back and did a, a use basically denial of service attacks to bring down ISP to help prevent this. And at the end of the revolution, basically the corrupt government was overthrown. Uh, which brings us to Libya. Um, um, the U.S. debated. The reason I'm talking about this in the realm of cyber warfare is that um, there's an article here describing how the U.S. debated whether or not to use cyber warfare attacks, simultaneous cyber and kinetic attacks against Libyan anti-air defense systems prior to airstrikes. It had been done before, but they declined to do so because they didn't want to set the precedent uh, for themselves. Just because other, it's global politics, geopolitics is really interesting and really lame at the same time. If the big dog in the room does it, it's okay for everyone else. But if the small guys in the room do it, it's not okay for everyone else. It's, it's weird. So still part of the Arab Spring, the Egyptian Revolution. Essentially, what started off as a peaceful revolution was met with force by corrupt government you know, officials. And the revolution was totally <coughs> organized over Facebook, Twitter, and social media. And so the government shut down the Internet. Um, so basically, this is... What happened as a result of that is the, civ the, the civilians shut down the government. And I'm sure everyone's still aware of what's going on there today. And there's basically still hacking activity going on now. So, which brings us to while we're still talking about 2011, all the fun that was had with certificate authorities. Um, we talked about Komodo previously. By the way, .fsu.edu uses a Komodo certificate. Um, DigiNoter got hacked. That's really relevant because it compromised in the, the Dutch government's outward facing websites. And as a result, DigiNoter was taken over completely by the Dutch government. So they basically to defend itself and figure out what had been compromised. In November of 2011, the US government declared that it has the right to meet cyber attacks with military force. And this is significant because it's basically the first step towards a declaratory policy for cyber war. Um, although this is just basically a rough statement that we reserve the right to defend ourselves with bullets, missiles, and bombs in the event that you hack us. But that's vague and doesn't mean much. It's kind of obvious, but doesn't draw the line in the sand. So it's also in November, yes. So it depends. Uh, say, say, let's just say North Korea happens to hack a U.S. citizen's computer and uses that to attack the NSA. What? Who's at fault, really? I mean, it's North Korea, but you have to go and do that investigation. You have to do the attribution, and even then, it could be someone masquerading as North Korea. So there's problems with attribution. And basically making the step to, OK, we're going to send the troops, we're going to send the bombs. So um, in November uh, that year, uh, the Honker Union, which is basically a set of hackers that had merged with the Red Hacker Alliance, declared war on basically Japan. And if this happened in the US, a group of hackers declared war on some other country, they would have been cracked down hard. Um, so this is an interesting event. So Japan announced basically plans to purchase a set of islands that were on the coast of China. And this group took great offense to that and decided to basically launch a long campaign of DDoS, website defacing, and basically destructive uh, activities against Japanese banks, both central and local small banks, universities, and civilian companies. Um, so not so much really government-related targets. Those were all civilian targets. Um, so in 2012 and through 2013, the New York Times basically reported on uh, how it had detect basically months long, uh, a four-month-long campaign of uh, uh, hacking as a retaliation that they allege 
for the New York Times investigating the wealth of the Chinese Communist Party's leader. Um, and they, New York Times published an article stating that he had amassed a fortune over $2 billion while in power. And some groups around the world obviously took offense to that. Allegedly, some of these Chinese groups did. And they hacked the New York Times systems for over four months, stole all the reporters' passwords at New York Times and used those same credentials to access the reporters' personal accounts and non-work systems. Um, they also hunted for specifically for all files related to the New York Times investigation. And uh, the reason uh, New York Times alleges that uh, Chinese hackers are involved in it is because the malware or hacking tools used, the custom hacking tools used to perpetrate this attack were the same tools used in other attacks that target the US military. Um, so that was an interesting article. And so before I go on, I want to say, just wrap that up in a general note on world perception on hacking. In general, hackers in the Western world are often anti-government and often get in trouble with government. They're not usually patriotic and they're not usually nationalistic. Um, and often 99% of what they do is considered criminal. Um, in the Eastern world, there, there are books stating all this, so I'm not saying this is fact. Um, but this is general perception that in the, basically in the East, hackers and groups of hackers are often actually pro-government and can be ignored by the government. There are cyber crime havens. Um, and so they can be patriotic and nationalistic, and countries are known for being havens for groups like that. And so while we're talking about groups of hackers, let's just dive into the deep end of advanced persistent threats and talk about the small history here. Um, so everyone should be familiar with Stuxnet. You should also be familiar with Dooku. And Flame came out last year, and Flame was an awesome piece of malware because it was written by some seriously top-notch group of crypt analysts along with other really skilled hackers and they were able to basically generate um, a code signing hash that would tell your system hey this is signed by Microsoft certificate they didn't have the code signing certificate to use we should all be familiar with you know certificate authorities being attacked to get code signing certificates they didn't actually have the code signing certificate. It was never issued to them. They just found the MD5 collision that would r render the same signature. So they used that and then basically sculpted the code to represent it. So that was really impressive. So what happened basically is once your system is infected, it tells your system that, hey, localhost is a, a Microsoft update server. And apparently Windows didn't think twice about that. It's like, oh, great, I'm my own server, so I'll connect to that. and I'll download and I'll steal all this code in the kernel and now, now I'm fully backdoored. So it was really impressive. So I want to quote the former director of the NSA and CIA, Michael Hayden here. And in this link, he talks to 60 Minutes on advanced persistent threats on stocks in that dude who um, He says that their authors legitimated the art of hacking as acceptable in the stage of international conflict. So he's obviously not going to say who did it, but which brings us to uh, what happened after Stuxnet. Um, after Stuxnet, Iranian facilities have been hit a number of times between now and 2010. Um, there was rumors early last year, um, around June, that two uranium enrichment facilities in Iran were hit again. It's unknown whether the virus is doing any damage, and it was actually after the fact it was announced, it was denied. Um, and this is this is understandable, and we'll talk about the reasons for denying a breach, denying a hack uh, later on. Um, it's more or less human nature because it makes you look really bad. It's bad for morale of a country and whatnot. So <clears throat> what's funny about this is that allegedly, Infected machines would lock up around midnight, turn the volume all the way up, and blare ACDC thunderstruck. 
So imagine a uranium enrichment facility. You can no longer control the machines. It's all playing Thunderstruck. That's pretty terrifying if you're trapped in that scenario. Um, so earlier this year, we talked in January how uh, Reuters and a number of other websites uh, reported that uh, there was a massive explosion in Iran felt uh, over three miles away in major metropolitan city that uh, originated at an underground bunker uh, at Fordo. And this is the same bunker that's uh, known to be used in uranium enrichment. The reason this is worth talking about is that the resulting explosion allegedly trapped 240 people underground. Um, so when you're dealing with warfare, even at the kinetics level, if you have to kill people, it's usually never advisable to target civilians. Now, I don't know if these 240 people were, were all, you know, scientists or all, you know, soldiers or a mix, but it's worth pondering. Um, so this is basically the satellite view of that facility is completely under a mountain. So it's immune to a bunker buster which is why the conclusion is that if there was an explosion here, it must have been a cyber weapon. So that's what the reason I'm talking about it. So, and within the last two weeks, uh, the Mandian report that you should all have heard about um, came out. And it's essentially, in 2010, the US said, we are officially being hacked by the Chinese government and its groups. This is basically the smoking gun evidence. Um, and these quotes are from the beginning of this report. Essentially, uh, this is a quote from Representative Mike Robert Rogers in 2011. His statement was that China's economic espionage has reached an intolerable level, and I believe the United States and our allies in Europe and Asia have an obligation to confront Beijing and demand that they put a stop to this piracy. Beijing is waging a massive trade war on, all, on us all, and we should band together to pressure them to stop. Combined, the United States and our allies in Europe and Asia have significant diplomatic and economic leverage over China. And we should use this to and our advantage to put an end to the scourge. Well, I'm not sure how much leverage you have if you can't stop borrowing from them, Mike. But to which the Chinese Defense Ministry uh, replied, um, is unprofessional and groundless to accuse the Chinese military of launching cyber attacks without any conclusive evidence. And thus, Mandiant Report was, for all intents and purposes, the smoking gun is the conclusive evidence. So the report details uh, all the trace activities of what is considered to be APT-1 as its designation in the malware and incident response world and they have identified, they've doxed APT-1 to be PLA unit 61398. And you read that in the report. Essentially, they described APT-1's activity as a long-term campaign at industrial espionage. They've stolen hundreds of terabytes of data, cyber physical sabotage probing and preparation. They've probed all the critical infrastructure weak points that they were interested in to see if they can cause failures, um, if they can cause destruction. And they've also had uh, a major intention of economic theft and sabotage. Um, they have video evidence of AP21 actors in action. Essentially, they hacked some of the relay points that they used to do some of their activities and just simply recorded what was going on. Um, so there's a lot of evidence there. And lastly, they precisely pinpointed the attacker's location. And it's a building full of dozens to hundreds of personnel that they claim. Now, I want to uh, pause here. I was watching a, uh, a great panel at the RSA uh, uh, conference this year. Uh, it just happened in January, I think. And there was a panel with uh, Whitfield Diffie, I think Ronald Rivest. Uh, those are obviously huge cryptographers and a number of other really impressive people. I think... Revest said that this is a really interesting report. However, the last part, how they attributed the physical location. Essentially, all the analysis up to that point was traffic analysis, showing that 
all these relay points are funneling traffic to this one location of one set of IPs that's located in Shanghai in this one city. Their next step to finding the building essentially is that, well, we, ha we know basically how many terabytes of data that they are processing every day based on their activities, and we've traced all their activities. So we have to find some center that can handle this. Well, it just so happens there's only one building in that city that has X number of fiber pipelines going to it. And so that's their attribution. And so he said that basically you could take the same report, touch up the details, and replace every instance of China with US, and use the same basically logic to pinpoint some building in Fort Meade, Maryland, and say, hey, you guys are doing it too. So that's what we're talking about. Um, and so China naturally claimed it's, well, just because you've proven that we do it, you guys do it too. And so this, this prompted an interesting debate. So I was watching CNN at the time, and Fried Zakaria was on. He had Mike Hayden on. I just previously quoted him. And this is a straight quote from the website. He said, Mike, the Chinese will say in response, or some of the Chinese will say, look, you guys do it too. You know, why are you getting so heated up? You know, you ran the CIA and the NSA. What would be your response to that? To which Michael Hayden replied, right. I freely admit that all nations spy. All nations conduct espionage. But some nations, nations like ours, self-limit. We steal other nations' secrets to keep Americans safe and free. We don't do it to make Americans rich or to make American industry profitable. And what the Chinese are doing is industrial espionage, trade secrets, negotiating positions, stealing that kind of information on an unprecedented scale for Chinese economic advantage. And that's why I think our response, our response should be in the economic zone, blah, 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 blah. So basically, you might argue it's like two kids fighting in a room. It's like, no, you hit me harder. I got to hit you proportionally back, right? Um, and so there's a lot of news reports saying that now this is such a big deal and there's basically spreading of rumors of war. And this is a trap. This is absolutely idiotic. Hopefully we don't go to war over this. That would be really sad, really unfortunate. Um, especially since North Korea has just declared its batshit crazy level has gone up. Um, and they're calling off the ceasefire. I don't know why. They must have had a bad game of basketball with whoever that guy is. Um, so if we go to war with China, North Korea would, you know, ramp up its activities as well. And there's no telling what they would do. So it's all really a bad idea. Things should just stay the way they are. They should, should keep the peace. Keep the peace. So we are basically kind of in the middle of the cyber cold war. And the evidence is kind of staring right at us. And so let's talk about basically the underground aspect of this, or really what I'd say the not so underground, because it's all there and you can find it all. There are a number of companies around the world that will find vulnerabilities, develop exploits to them for them, and not disclose them with a the vendor, and sell these exploits to single customers, usually governments. In essence, they're cyber weapon defense contractors. There's a company in France that uh, sells exclusively to NATO companies, uh, NATO countries and uh, agencies. And I think the, uh, if I remember correctly, I think the buy-in to see their catalog, they have a catalog of all these fabulous weapons, um, is I think is three million. You have to spend three million just to see what they offer. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's what many would call a ethically challenged industry. Um, so nonetheless, it's very similar to the parallels of defense contractors. This just so happens to be for cyberspace. You see that there's this war going on in cyberspace right now. So what's the price for an O-Day? Think about it. Well, it depends really on a lot of specifics. Is that O-Day, is that exploit, platform specific? Does it only work on Windows? Does it only work on Windows XP 32-bit or Windows 8 32-bit? 
Does it only work on 64-bit? Does it work on any platform, Linux and Windows? Is it some huge fundamental thing that computer science just got wrong? Does it, if it's not that, this basically super level of exploit, what does, it, what does it allow an attacker to do? Does it allow the attacker to uh, execute uh, remote code? I shouldn't have put access here, I should put execution. Um, is it simply just a denial of service exploit? You run it, it'll cause a service to crash. Um, or does it allow privilege escalation? So I did some searching on my own. I found basically a write-up from, I think, last year's Pwned Own. And so Pwned Own is a contest run by vendors, and they pay basically $60,000 right up front if you find a, a vulnerability in their systems. And it's basically they throw people at Chrome, Firefox, IE, et cetera. So this company had sent a team. This, this company is called Vupen. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Sent a team of their pros, and they wiped the floor. But they didn't share any of their vulnerabilities with uh, the vendors. The vendors were offering $60,000. They just showed them that your, sh your stuff sucks. You guys are noobs. Um, and they said, we wouldn't share the details of an exploit with a vendor even for a million dollars. And essentially, the exploits at this contest are basically a combination of sandbox escape and remote code execution. So, to quote uh, Vupan's chief executive, they said, we don't want to give them any knowledge that can help them in fixing this exploit or similar exploits. We want them to keep we want to keep this for our customers. And so here we are, a room full of security researchers, and it's hard not to see the grill in the room. That not only is doing the bad stuff profitable, but you can establish a company and operate completely in the public, servicing a host government. So. Is this really even a black market at that point? They advertise their products on Twitter. So how fast does this market move? It, hopefully it's not that fast. Hopefully we good guys are you know, on the cutting edge. Well, according to their Twitter feed is that they've already hacked Windows 8 and IE 10 and completely pumped them. So don't know. So let's talk about Stuxnet because that's been extremely analyzed. Um, and the great people at Sim Simtech have done some amazing analysis of it. And just recently, they announced that they discovered and have finished analyzing Stuxnet uh, version 0.5, the precursor to what was uh, recognized as the world as the Stuxnet. So they found the precursor and what they dub as the missing link. So Stuxnet version 1.0 had four Windows zero-day exploits. And I have them listed here so you can look them up yourself. Essentially. Three of them allow for remote code execution, and one allows for administrator privilege escalation. Now, if you're buying this in the black market, that's super expensive. Because if they're not willing to you know, disclose those things for a million dollars to vendors, and that was obviously remote code execution plus sandbox escape, three of those things plus a privilege escalation is like So, <clears throat> Symantec's analysis of the missing link Stuxnet found that it was in the wild before 2005. So that means that we're approaching 2015 and we're ending the first decade of essentially cyber warfare. That so much so we can have basically an hour long lecture on it. What slide am I on? So since we're talking about that level of attacks, I'm about halfway through. Um, it's important to know supply chain attacks because that very first event that I talked about, the Siberian sabotage, was actually a supply chain attack. Even though they were stealing from our supply chain to use in theirs, we sabotaged what they were stealing and it caused that explosion. So supply chain attack does not mean basically running and gunning on the enemy's convoy. It means essentially if they're using your products and you can control perhaps that company that's manufacturing the microchips, or you can control the borders that it's being transported through, you can manipulate that product. So you can install hardware backdoors, 
you can install remote kill switches. And so the state perhaps can influence, if it controls a company, can influence that product's design, its features, or perhaps secret features, and even perhaps have security backdoors or a blatant lack of security in some instances to be easily exploited. So the problem with this is that if you install backdoors and someone else finds out about them, it's not just you. So um, there's been a lot of rumors that uh, people are alleging outright that uh, a Chinese company called Huawei that is, does telecommunications technology uh, does this, has secret backdoors, but I don't know anything about that. So there's rumors of it going on. It's, conceptually, it's not unprecedented. It happened in the Cold War. So what happens if these backdoors get hijacked, perhaps by other nations? Like there's a North, I, you know, we're buying these North Korean routers and actually, you know, Iran finds the backdoor and they are attacking us and it looks like it's actually North Korea. Who do we attribute and how? So aside from state-sponsored supply chain attacks, there's actually been instances of uh, state-sponsored personnel attacks. In 2012, it was reported that while a CEO was going through a security checkpoint at an airport, you know, they take all the stuff, put it under the x-ray scanner. They took the smartphone he had, dumped all the data off of it, and stole his password, his, his enterprise credentials for his company, logged in as him, and stole a ton of IP. And then went on to actually use his account to perform spear phishing. And the victim was totally unaware of it until much later. So as we're approaching billions and billions and billions of things connected to the internet, imagine supply chain attacks. And these type of attacks for what we are calling the internet of things. Everything's being connected. I like this diagram on the right. It's the absolute worst diagram I could find. I mean, you have, you have wires running from your toaster into the water of your toilet into a TV that's showing you what's inside the toaster. It's like, what? <laughs> How did, did Congress put together that diagram? <laughs> so um, we have basically a, a vast mind blowing amount of things that are being connected to each other that your grandparents would have never thought would ever need a, a, a microchip in them. And so this is a great diagram to put things in perspective. In 2008, the number of things connected to the internet exceeded the number of people on Earth. In 2020, there will be 50 billion things connected to the internet if we keep going at this rate. So this is all really hard to understand, especially if you're making laws and policies to secure this stuff. And people really fail to see how connecting all these things together can have really any impact that can be exploited by attackers. Um, and so because they don't understand the problem, everyone's looking for a cyber Pearl Harbor or cyber Katrina, cyber 9-11. I just want to take these people and choke the life out of them because it's absolutely idiotic. And I'll talk about why it's idiotic. Um, so the reality of things is that the unsecured internet is creating pathway to destructive attacks. Um, to quote Arthur Coviello Jr., I butchered his name, I'm sure, but he was a keynote speaker at RSA 2013. Um, he said that attacks on digital systems that result in physical destruction will no longer require manual intervention. In other words, he's talking about the internet of things and how we're creating so many more pathways for things to go wrong because everything's connected. I may be able to attack you not through basically uh, your machine, perhaps through some device that has a computer in it, and I can host my malware there and use that as a pivot point, perhaps on your fridge, and perhaps you know poison you and kill you by manipulating things in your fridge or something like that, or perhaps infect the entire uh, city's uh, air conditioning units and cause them all to turn off and on in synchronized times and that will cause effectively whiplash on the power grid. These are, these are little things that it's just, if, if you understand how these things work, it just blows your mind. And so 
in effect, what he's trying to say is that there's going to be so many things that can go wrong. We can't re rely on responding to these things in a manual way. We have to have faster and smarter intervention. We have to have automated smart defenses to deal with these things. So, whoops. All right, so here's the perception. We only see really the tip of the iceberg and no one really understands what's below. The reality is that it's really worse than what we see. But we don't know how worse it is. So before we proceed, it's wise to note human nature that no one admits, no one likes admitting they got hacked. Admitting your company got breached was really bad for business. So many of these things actually get pushed under the rug. So our perception is even, is naturally just worse due to human nature. So what will it take to bridge this gap? Um, it's a really tough question. Everyone's hoping for, you know, these, these cyber pearl harbors and Katrinas. And it's kind of understood that will bridge the gap. But do we really have to wait for something that bad? That's what people at RSA and this conference are trying to ask. And it's a good question. Why do we have to wait for this? We know it's that bad. Well, it really comes down to the fact that the kinetic aspect of cybersecurity and the kinetic impacts are really, really hard to think about. Um, and as for warfare, cyber warfare is totally unlike kinetic warfare. When you launch a Tomahawk troops missile, it's gone, it's spent. When you launch a Stuxnet, someone can copy and paste it and use it somewhere else. And battles in cyberspace need not be won with decisive attacks. If I get a backdoor in your system, I can just own you over time. There also need not be any really victory objectives. It's not like I go and take capital and it's game over. And then everything in, in cyber warfare can be automated. We have malware, Trojans, etc. We're not going to face war fatigue. We're not going to have families with soldiers overseas, you know, missing their their daughters and sons. There's not going to be public protests. Cyber warfare can go on forever. So it can be basically a very effective uh, tactic for long-term attrition to perhaps tip the balance of power. And effectively, you can play very efficiently by just cheating, lying, and robbing other people blind. So the, the cyber kinetic perception uh, is one of the main problems. It's that, and there's some good work being done at, I think, uh, the SANS Institute. They're putting together a mock town, like a model, model train set town. And it's a cyber warfare town and training simulator. So they have basically a little military base, they have a hospital, they have a power plant, and essentially they have all these interesting scenarios like uh, enemies have hacked into the power plant and they're, they've locked out the defenders. You have to hack in yourself and kick them out and turn everything back online. And there's, you know, people have hacked the missile launchers at the military base. You have to hack them to disable them or they're gonna blow up the hospital. Um, it's obviously toy stuff, but it's unfortunately what is necessary to make important people in this country and in the world understand the consequences of what can go wrong in cyberspace. So let's talk about the perhaps the goals of say if FSU were its own country and we wanted to go to war with UF and their their own country. The policy, the, the, the perhaps the goals we would have. Um, we'd probably have uh, political goals. Uh, we'd want to influence perhaps uh, the value of our students over theirs. Our degrees are worth way better. We pump out X number of degrees. It's our GDP. Our GDP is way better than yours. We maybe want to, I don't know, sabotage your students. Um, we perhaps want to influence the, the balance of power, perhaps make our football ratings look better, or stuff like that. Um, we perhaps want to censor bad stories about us or stomp out the, dis uh, the dissidents. Um, we perhaps want to steal their good ideas, steal their research. I mean, if we're really just like that bad, bad people. Um, so we can keep our competitive advantage 
Um, and so we want to, if we're, I don't know, going to face them in, in football, maybe spread uh, rumors on their forums that, hey, our star players are down. So they change their tactics, I don't know. Um, but also, it's on a more real say, setting, on the world stage, it's completely reasonable to engage in cyber warfare to prevent war, um, especially to prevent world war and nuclear war. Um, obviously, what's going on with Stuxnet and Iran, Iran's attacks is that whoever's behind them is obviously trying to prevent them from having nuclear weapons because they believe that they will use them. Um, they've only told the UN that they'll do that a dozen times. So, so here's what the common perception of what cyber war would look like: is that there will basically be targeted efforts and per pervasive cultural efforts to uh, launch war, and it will be all the time large-scale denial of service, and critical infrastructure and finance will be constantly getting hit. And there will be secrets being stolen, maybe. At that point, stealing secrets doesn't matter unless you're stealing intelligence secrets. Um, and so, but there would likely be large-scale sabotage, and it would likely be, con be combined with kinetic actions. Because if you're causing that many things to go wrong, you've obviously provoked whoever you're attacking into actual war. And that's what everyone's looking for. They're looking for the actual Pearl Harbor, that brink of war setting. Um, but that's not why. If I were going to be launching a cyber war against a country, the worst outcome would be to provoke you. I could happily steal everything I wanted and rob you blind. Why would I want to trigger an actual war? I can beat you on the world stage if I can steal all your secrets, if I can sabotage your financial sectors and lower your GDP. I can just naturally, economically overcome you if I steal everything you do and sabotage UDB. So, <sighs> such a war has yet to be seen, really, I guess, until the recent debate now, where Michael Hayden's coming out and saying, yes, we all hack each other, but you guys are doing it for economic advantage, and we're not. But whether or not that's trustworthy, I'll leave that for you guys to decide. I'm not here to force opinions down your throat. Um, so this long-term attrition-based cyber warfare was actually seen during the Cold War with KGB's Line X initiative to steal all this intellectual property from us to catch up on the decades of technology that they're behind on. And so in such a, such a setting, it would It'd be interesting to see whether or not there's a targeted effort from a small set of actors or there's pervasive cultural effort where everyone's doing it. Um, surely it's going to depend on what part of the world you are in and the culture there. And so large-scale sabotage of causing things to go wrong, causing things to blow up here in a long-term attrition-based cyber war is actually unlikely. Sure, you may probe to make sure that if things do go wrong, things hit the fan, I can hit them where it hurts. So I may probe to see that there's certain abilities, but I won't be turning them on. I won't be exploiting them. So there will likely be large-scale espionage of secrets, IP, and uh, perhaps finance will be targeted much more than critical infrastructure. So the goal is to attack yet avoid provocation and to essentially to shift superpower status over time or some sort of status over time. And so since we're talking about war at that level, it's interesting to kind of ponder the possibility of collateral damage and ponder the question of when can a virus or an exploit be a war crime? Because as we've seen, these APT efforts have caused explosions in various places and perhaps have trapped people underground. So we know that uh, cyber tri triggered kinetic actions can kill people. And so even in the instance where they don't kill people, Chevron was actually had its systems massively hit by Stuxnet <laughs> in 2010. So who's responsible for that? Um, is whoever wrote, whoever wrote that responsible to pay them and damages caused. Um, 
And so also in, in document leaking talk, we talked about uh, how the informants revealed in the WikiLeaks dumps were basically rounded up and assassinated. And the instance of perhaps if DigiNoter was actually used as a, a stepping stone in an attack against the Dutch government, which I guess is pretty unlikely, uh, the result of that is they actually went bankrupt and they're a civilian company. So, <sighs> imagine all the, the collateral damage that would be caused by hacking cyber physical systems, and br bringing down air traffic control systems, traffic lights, railroads, the power grid, manufacturing sector perhaps, um, in terms of economic collateral damage, and so on and so on. And here it's, it's really important to note that if you're uh, dealing with security here, zero days in cyber physical systems terminology is equivalent to forever days because these things never get patched. So if you happen to have these systems and they're connected to a perhaps an intranet at a lab or a manufacturing plant and the virus gets in on the systems, it's going to get attacked perhaps. So in the instance that uh, you know these systems are never patched, which is almost everything on this list, um, if an O day is weaponized and gets out there and gets used, it can be basically reused by anyone else forever. So when, if you're in that room and you're starting to pull the trigger on this plan or that plan for whatever decision, you have to ponder the real possibility of it being used anywhere else at any time. So, however, yeah, so it gets crazy. So let's stop talking about that for a moment and switch gears to the problem of attribution. So it is almost impossible to accurately identify attackers because they could be spoofing all their look, all their IP addresses. At, in some settings, they could be behind proxies, they could be using Tor, and really for real attribution, you need hard evidence. Um, and there's many services that will that allow any sort of activity on their networks as long as it's not child porn. Um, for instance, there's, I have a list here of uh, anonymous VPN uh, services that actually do take your anonymity completely seriously. And if you use them, you can't be tracked whatsoever. They don't keep any logs. Even if the government was for to subpoena them, they would simply reply, we have no logs, come see yourself. Um, so, say you get some dumb attackers and they don't use these uh, these services, or perhaps the services that they're using get hacked and they start video recording exactly what they're doing, like in the case of uh, the Mandiant report. And say they're identified. Now, we have to think about the case of what if it's a civilian group inside a country that's at doing the attack? Is it affiliated with the government? Is it sanctioned by the government? Is it covert and the government doesn't know about it? Attribution here is very much affected by those possibilities. And in, one, in which instances, say, we get hacked by a civilian group in another country and it causes a massive amount of damage. Say it causes the next 9-11. Thousands of people die, everything goes wrong. But it's a civilian group. Can that be considered an act of war? And if they legitimately weren't sanctioned by that government? If it is, how do we prevent our people from doing it? How do we prevent our citizens from doing it? This is a really difficult problem. And what about the case of multinational groups that span multiple borders perpetrating such attacks? And then what about groups that are simply perhaps uh, in one country but are utilizing the safe haven uh, nature of other countries to launch their attacks against you? So. The next slide. And then this brings us to black flag operations. Perpetrating attack and in, in person, impersonating or masquerading as person B, some other team. Or perhaps using your weaponized ODA and leaving comments in Chinese, or leaving comments in Greek or Turkish to obviously throw off the investigation and make them think that other people did that. And then in the instance that you really want to send people down a rabbit hole, doing this is basically a like a double cross or a triple cross, a double black flag, triple black flag, and then using botnets to do this. That spans all countries. You have to you have to hunt down the C two 
network, you have to trace basically where the the bot master is actually logging in as, and then even then, it gets crazier. And now we're approaching an era where UAV drones are going to be everywhere. What happens if uh, one gets hacked and is used for some malicious action? Attributing and finding out the hack, the data to do that may not be in the black box for that drone if it gets crashed. So it's a real rabbit hole of possibilities. And then dealing with repurposed Stuxnets and stuff like that. So how do we begin making policies and laws with all this uncertainty? It's really a problem that I'm glad I don't have to face. Um, however, I'm going to complain about how poorly uh, those in power have faced it, uh, quite gleefully. So <clears throat> cyber technology and the internet has forced Congress to update almost every aspect of law. Taxation, protecting children, piracy, theft, and copying. I mean, it's really interesting to note that uh, computer piracy is not really theft. You're not depriving the original owner of a physical entity that they once possessed. You're copying it. So that's had to change all of that law, addressing the problems, uh, the criminal problems that arose there. Um, and then laws about privacy, or perhaps the total lack thereof nowadays. Um, but what also about war declaring policies? Establishing policy here faces significant challenges. And so um, a term you guys should be familiar with is the, Cy the Convention on Cybercrime. It happened in 2001, and I think it's happened a number of times since then. But it's effectively the first international treaty seeking to address computer crime and internet crimes. It did this by making strides to harmonize laws. That means basically making laws compatible with each other across nations. And to also make efforts to improve investigative techniques. At the time, that was a complete failure, the latter part, improving investigative techniques. Um, attribution on the internet is really hard because there's no identification requirement to use the internet. And you'll hear all sorts of advocates for all sorts of different solutions here requiring people to have a universal ID to use the internet so there's no more anonymity, anonymity is dead. And then using TPM to establish that, I don't know about that. So, and they also in this convention, really, the the foremost thing they tried to do is increase cooperation among nations and stop fighting. So as of 2010, 30 states had signed and ratified this treaty and have it enacted in their law. The United States is one of them. Um, I believe China and Japan is all, are also ones too. So that's really interesting to think about. Um, also, at that time, 16 states had it signed but not ratified it into the law. So since we're agreeing to basically pay ball, let's talk about the breakdown of responsibility the U.S. government has for securing the Internet. So the DOD is responsible for .mil, the DHS is responsible for .gov, but who is responsible for .com and policing that? How do you even go about suggesting who should do this? Is if if a government do, if a government agency or department does this, is the private sector expected to cooperate with them? And if so, you're going to have trust problems, even if it's DHS, and especially understandably if it's NSA. What if compromised private sector systems are used to attack the .gov and the .mil systems? So, but this trust has uh, has been overcome. It's been this trust issue has been conquered in the past. Uh, when Google was being uh, attacked by Chinese actors or actors originating allegedly in China, um, they went to the NSA for help, allegedly. Uh, I only found rumors of this. Now think about why it would only be kept as rumors and you don't go out and say it. If, if your customers use you because they value the sense of privacy they get from your services, if you go and collaborate and cooperate with uh, a government agency, it can ruin that value that they have in your service. So <laughs> you, have, you have problems here. So perhaps the only way to do it is to do it uh, in secret, to collaborate in secret. And so let's talk about the extent to which they can collaborate, though. So. 
cooperation is hindered really by co uh, corporations and willingness to share with their competitors. So the government, like you can't just bring Google, Microsoft, Apple, and all these people in the same room as someone from NSA or DHS at the table and expect them to fully cooperate uh, without disclosing perhaps details on their own security setup. And these details can be used by the competitors against them perhaps to say, hey, that's a really dumb idea. Good thing we do it this way. You know, um, and likewise, the government's unable to disclose classified data and sensitive data. Maybe they actually have the, the inside knowledge. They have a mole on the enemy team, and this team is you know, hitting all these private sector companies. And they actually have uh, all the info on their motives and their goals and their you know, stated objectives. But they can't share that because it's classified and expose that actor. So they can't share classified and sensitive data so they, they're limited to how much they can disclose. And so, and even then, if you get this level of cooperation, you're going to have uh, a real, very real fear at these companies of, of public backlash. So let's talk about uh, U.S. legislature in this area, or what I'd subtitle as a history of failure. Um, in the 80s, it was... Uh, several laws were proposed to weaponize cryptography and make it illegal. Imagine how different the internet would be today if we had no cryptography. You wouldn't have SSL, you wouldn't have e-banking, you wouldn't have e-anything. Thankfully, this, these efforts did not pass. However, cryptography is still affected by import-export laws in almost all nations. And so, I'm sure everyone in the room has heard about SOPA and PIPA, and that was in 2011 and the massive protests. Essentially, all this was was a draconian approach to, uh, to filter DNS systems, to basically censor them and blacklist unapproved websites for the purposes of stopping private piracy. However, piracy was poorly defined in the legislature and thus could be manipulated. So it, a sense, would have established the power for political and corporate censorship of the internet. Luckily, this did not pass. So, I'll end that section of that subtitle and just talk about related things that I think are perhaps more interesting and less just bad idea. Because in this instance, I mean, it doesn't stop you from typing in the IP address of wherever you want to go. It really is not a solution. It did way more bad than it did any good. It actually didn't even do anything to solve the problem. They completely did not solve the problem, just created more problems. That's why I consider it a massive failure. So <clears throat> this is a bill being considered. I don't think it's been signed into law yet. Um, I don't know. I'm not familiar with the history of its decisions on the rulings of it. But effectively grants the executive branch to shut down parts of the internet. And essentially uh, for the purposes of national security and defense. So. That's worth considering. Um, but more importantly, the Cybersecurity Act of 2012, last year it was, uh, it was proposed. It did not pass. Um, its stated goal is to set cybersecurity standards for critical infrastructure operators and would have encouraged companies and the government to share information with each other about cyber threats to basically establish that level of cooperation because currently there is no level of that cooperation. We're trying to meet that treaty. That treaty is a good good idea. I honestly, that's my opinion. I believe that treaty is a good idea. Uh, if you can get everyone to do it. So implementing it, you know, even though you've ratified it, you have to work towards it. That could take decades and so on. So the main purpose of this was really to raise situational awareness by sharing information on critical infrastructure. And that's where, where we could be hit hardest. So opposing groups cited privacy concerns most understandably very similar to uh, CISPA, which we'll talk about next. But the bill expi explicitly prohibited sharing citizen data with military and intelligence community groups. Um, so I think uh, having least privilege in your legislature makes sense and is a good idea. Um, and so let's talk about CISPA, the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and uh, Protection Act. I know many, many people, many people I know are a big fan of this and bills like this. Um, as it's written, it has a number of problems. 
Its stated goal is to provide for the sharing of certain cyber threat intelligence and cyber threat information between intelligence communities and cybersecurity entities and for other purposes. The end for other purposes is really what kills it because the way it's written is so open-ended that to quote the EFF, it carves a loophole in all known privacy laws and grants legal immunity for companies to share your private information. So it passed the House in uh, 2012, but did not pass in the Senate. Uh, I think it was filibustered down our island. I don't follow politics that much. It's being reintroduced uh, this year. Uh, this February, it was reintroduced. <coughs> in effect, it requires ISPs and websites to track a vast amount of information on their users for the purposes of sharing with the government for cybersecurity purposes and for other purposes. So this costs the ISPs and those companies money because disk space plus time equals money. So basically, as a trade bag, the act allows them to resale, resell the info to anyone for cybersecurity and for other purposes, right? And like, what do you mean by cybersecurity purposes? It doesn't define that precisely. The language is so vague, it could be anything. So my information could be resold for cybersecurity purposes, and then I can get Viagra spam. And that clearly is not something that should be enabled by law. So it, the bill directly circumvents the Cable Communications Policy Act, the Wiretap, Wiretap Act, the Video Privacy Protections Act, the Electronic Communication uh, Privacy Act as well. And so these laws expressly allow for lawsuits against companies that go too far in divulging your private information. However, CISPA terminology goes so far to directly uh, state that companies are not required to notify any of their customers if their data is mishandled in complying with CISPA. And that goes for the government as well. So remember, this is not yet passed, but it's being voted on now. So in our, what this means is if these, all these people are tracking you so they can share information with the government, if I want to spy on you, I don't have to just hack the government. I don't have the options, of, the limit options to just hacking you or hacking the government or hacking your favorite site. I can just hack these other sites as well. I have X number of ways, X number of more ways to get at you now. So this creates many problems. So that's the end of class. I'm going to pick up the, uh, the rest of the lecture next time. And so, all right.